Hey, good morning, and thank you for connecting on this uh, session. We continue with learning about the book of Hebrews. We started out in the next, uh, in the last session, by uh, looking at Hebrews chapter one, and we were somewhere uh, midway, or, or maybe you know just uh, in the earlier passages. So we'll continue with that. Let's pray, and uh, we'll. Uh, get into our session. Let me just uh, begin with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that your word brings light. Uh, even today, Father, as we take time in the book of Hebrews, may your word come alive, O oh God. And Father, may uh, Lord, the truth of your word, O oh Father God, help us, uh, Lord, walk aligned to your heart and uh, lord to honor you to serve you uh, even better lord thank you lord thank you for this opportunity in jesus name we pray amen okay so let's uh, get back to hebrews chapter one here and in the last class we saw how god spoke to us in many different ways but the best way that he used was his son, Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the pattern, the best pattern of uh, God's character and God's um, manner of working. And we said that he is the very express image or, or you know, in other words, something like a mirror image or even better of the heavenly father. We saw how God uh, has orchestrated everything and he, he has set things in motion by the word of his power. We also saw how we are invited to worship our Lord Jesus Christ who has received a name which is greater than any other name by inheritance and that the Lord Jesus is exalted by the Father. We saw the interactions within the Trinity, the way the Father speaks to the son and uh, he declares that the angels are meant but to worship the son and so we were discussing and we were saying that angels are created and uh, they are subject to jesus and jesus is deity he is the christ he is the son of the living god uh, and therefore we must not mix up the two we also remember that the Lord Jesus is um, eternal, whereas the angels are created beings. Uh, now, we were also saying that the angels are ministering spirits. They are spirits by uh, you know, their nature, uh, but they are ministering spirits. So the term used is uh, lit litur liturgos or liturgos. Uh, liturgos, where it simply means they are like public servants for the Lord. They have been uh, called by God or created by God to serve or the, in other words, minister. That's where, you know, we understand minister or ministry. So that is their role. We saw how uh, they worship God. And we looked at the word worship also, uh, the understanding that it really means to uh, be in adoration as if to even bow down before God. So that is the role of the angels unto the Lord. And we said that even we should be worshiping God for who he is. Now let's uh, continue from verse 8. We read the entire passage in the last class, so we're not going to uh, read it once again. I'll just go on explaining here. So from verse 8 to verse 14, we see uh, some quotes which are from the book of Psalms. Now, you don't have to worry uh, about jotting down all these uh, uh, references. I have stated earlier that one of the primary commentaries that uh, we are going by is David Guzik. So it's mentioned in his commentary already. But uh, yeah, uh, it's in case you want to take it down, you're most welcome to. So Psalm 45, verses 6 through 7, uh, Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27, and Psalm 110, verse 1, are the passages which are quoted here. Uh, so as we look at these passages from verse 8, we see the way the Father speaks to the Son. So it is written here, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, 
a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom many things to understand about the lord jesus here through the comparison between jesus and the angels we concluded that jesus is eternal and that uh, he is not a created being earlier we said that he was involved in creation uh, he is a ruler and re- he is the ruler and he reigns over everything uh, all things are subject to the power of his word now let's add to that what according to verse 8 what we are understanding is that the father is addressing the son as o oh god that's very interesting the father is addressing the son as o oh god so what does that mean in the trinity jesus is co equal that is why even the father is referring to jesus the son as o oh god so another thing that we can add to our understanding of christ is that he is co equal with the father and that describes uh, the trinity for us where god is three persons in one and all these three persons are co equal meaning uh, one is not above the other but they they are all uh, on level ground and he also talks about the rule and reign of the lord jesus christ so that again gives us the picture that the lord jesus is a is a, a ruler or he is a king uh, and uh, that the way he rules is with righteousness so it says a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom so we understand that he is the one who is who is uh, coming back again he will uh, rule and reign at the time of the millennium uh, we know that he will judge the world so a position of rulership is what he has now as we move on to verse 9 it again reveals to us the character of our lord jesus where the verse says you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness so you know it really tells us that god is a very just judge he is uh, happy with what is righteous before him but the things that are lawless he hates it okay so because of such a, a character that he possesses we understand that you know god has anointed him with the oil of gladness more than his companions so there is a reward for walking in righteousness and disliking you know this, a stronger word is used here hating lawlessness so uh, it, it just shows that that god is so pure and so very just in the manner in which he deals with things so jesus christ yes he is a ruler but he is also a righteous ruler from verses 10 and 11 it says you lord in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands they will perish but you remain and they will all grow old like a garment now we've already understood the work of the lord jesus in creation as much as the father is involved the holy spirit is involved even the lord jesus is involved now to add to that we see that the heavens will perish um so it's it's a uh, you know it it's a thought that not very easy for us to digest because we see the certainty of the things around us you know every day uh, the sun rises and every every uh, day the sun sets there is a night and this is the experience of our lives and for us to imagine that one fine day these things will not happen is is uh, very challenging to really sort of come to terms with but what the writer of the hebrews is trying to tell us is that even these things will perish so the heavens will which are the work of god's hands the earth right uh, uh, all of these things will perish but the lord jesus himself is self existent so that is another attribute that we can add to the lord jesus he is self existent and talking about uh, the heavens it's amazing that he would say something like they will all grow old like a 
garment. Uh, so it's as if, you know, some when we have old cloth, what we tend to do if it is of no use and, uh, uh, you know, it's useless to us, we just throw it. And similarly, he is saying that even the heavens will perish in that way. But one thing about our God is that he is self-existent. He will never perish. Now, verse 12, uh, continuing in that same thread, he says, like a cloak, you will fold them up. So, you know, all this language makes it sound like the heavens are nothing for God. He'll just fold it up one day uh, and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will not fail. So we are reminded of the uh, that God is eternal, Jesus is eternal, that Jesus is self-existent. And if you want to use other words here, you could use words like immutable, meaning unchanging. He will never change. You can even uh, finally attribute this word almighty to the Lord Jesus because all these other characteristics that we just listed out have to do with deity or God. We don't, we don't uh, speak about man in this way. You know, man is mortal. Man uh, is destined to die one day, you know, as far as this world is concerned. But when we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, it's so very clear that uh, he was more than a man. Uh, he was God himself. And uh, that, you know, he has those characteristics that we talk about of being omniscient, uh, omnipresent and omnipotent. Verse 13, uh, it says, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? And in this, what we are understanding is that God, the Father, has called Jesus to sit at his right hand. Now, again, coming back to the expression of sitting down is to see that somebody has completed the work which they were supposed to do. And therefore, now is the time to rest. So now that the Lord Jesus has finished the work of redemption, he very victoriously sits at the right hand of the Father and the Father is speaking about the victory that will continue to uh, completion before the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we know that Jesus has already won the victory on the cross but there are many things that are unfolding in the world uh, which are tending towards that completion and the Lord Jesus will watch that. He will see that all these things will finally culminate uh, in proclaiming and declaring the ultimate victory of our Lord Jesus, which is already won on the cross of Calvary for us. Uh, and finally, he reminds us about the angels. He says in verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. So referring to angels, once again he's saying ministering, meaning serving spirits. They have a task given to them by God and whom do they serve? They serve those who will inherit salvation. So who are the ones who will inherit salvation? Sorry? Who will inherit salvation? I'm not able to hear anyone. Yeah. So we, the believers, are the ones who will inherit salvation. And therefore, our understanding is that angels are serving spirits who will help us. And God sends them to help those who believe. And uh, that is something we can settle in our minds. And how are angels activated? I think we discussed about this also in the last class or rather in the some of the courses earlier. How are angels activated? Any idea? They come to help us. That's fine. But how do they, how do they work? Anyone?
Okay, age has come to help us. That we've settled. How do you put them to work? We can uh, expect the ministry of angels when we command. Okay, that's true. We can expect the ministry of angels. That part, uh, yes. Uh, command, uh, meaning John? Um, in, in the sense to to, uh, to request okay. the Lord to send his angels because he has said, I'll huh. send my angels to guard over you. And... Okay. So, yeah, in that way. Okay. So, um, yeah. So we can pray to God to send angels and for angels to help us. But here's the thing for us to remember. Psalm 103 and verse 20, it tells us uh, his angels who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. So that's a reminder that the angels by uh, hierarchy or the way they have been formed, they are designed to respond to the word of God. So we cannot cut that structure and command angels. It won't work. We can pray to God because ultimately God has to call the uh, give the instructions. Only then angels will work because they heed the voice of his word. So that's the way angels work. Not by us telling them what to do. They won't listen to us because God is their ultimate chief commander. But if we want them to work for us, one of the things that we can do is declare the word of God. You know, when we say, for example, uh, John, you just mentioned and said that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. That is already the spoken word of God. So when I declare, even when we make declarations, we can expect angels to start to work in line with that declaration. Okay? Of course... It's like God commanding them. We can't command them. But that word in itself is like a command to them. And so they will work. right? So these are all the ways. One is we can pray, expect for ministry of angels. Uh, secondly, we can declare God's word over our lives. And those declarations will... You know, as all these days, you know, they people use some language like activate and all. So basically, angels will listen to it and they will obey the voice of the Lord. So that's the way in which they work. Okay. So uh, overall, in Hebrews chapter 1, if we try to uh, look at the emphasis, the emphasis would be on the Lord Jesus being a part of the Trinity. The Lord Jesus being fully God. So all the attributes of God, we've listed them out, right? Things like uh, creator, eternal, um, immutable, unchanging. Okay. Uh, so all of this is attributed to our Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, in essence, Hebrews chapter 1 is stating that the Lord Jesus is God. Okay, so that's the key message that is coming through. In addition to that, there is a mention of angels and uh, the clarity that the author gives uh, to the believers saying, angels are just ministering spirits. They are there to help those who believe and that one should not worship them. They may be heavenly beings, but that doesn't mean that we are so much in awe of heavenly beings and angels that we start to worship them. Instead, we need to worship the Lord and angels also worship the Lord. Okay, so these are the key points. Any, um, any thoughts or questions before we proceed to Hebrews chapter 12 here?
Okay. So I think that's uh, quite clear. Uh, let's move on to Hebrews chapter 2. Would someone like to read the entire passage, please? This again is quite long. <coughs> Therefore, we must give the more honest heed to things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who had him? God has bear also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified, testified in a certain place saying, what is a man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of the death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God might test death for everyone. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom all, all things in bringing my sons to glory to make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both for both he who satisfies and, and those who are being satisfied are all of one. For which reason is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare you your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here I am. And here am I and the children whom God has given. In as much then as the children were partaken of flesh and blood, he himself like, likewise shared the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all there lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in, in things pertaining to God, to make appropriation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are being tempted. Amen. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lubega. That was quite a long passage that you read for us. And we appreciate that. Now coming to Hebrews chapter 2, we have a couple of themes. So I'll just state it and then we get into understanding the entire passage. So initially, there is a warning. As I shared when we began the book of Hebrews, it was written to persecuted Jewish believers. They were people who were going through a lot of difficulties. So there was always a temptation of uh, letting go of their newfound faith. So time and again, the writer is encouraging them and even warning them just to let them know that they must not give up. So it starts with uh, like an urge not to neglect 
the great salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ because doing so will have consequences. And then he goes on to talking about the humanity of Jesus. So in chapter 1, it was all about the deity of Jesus Christ. In chapter 2, it's about the humanity of our Lord Jesus and how he uh, shared in our humanity in such a way that he has become our merciful and our faithful high priest before God for us. So these are some key things that we will look into. So starting out with verse 1, he starts with that warning that I talked of. He says, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. So he's reminding the believers that whatever they have heard about the Lord Jesus, and especially through what he has stated right now, he has stated about the supremacy of our Lord Jesus Christ and that he is God himself. So that truth, he's telling them not to let go of it. Don't let go of the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, Don't neglect it. And he says something like, take, give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. Meaning, there are things we know about God to be true. Things we know about Jesus to be um, real. So these revelations must be revisited. These revelations must be held on to. And we must never let it go. Never neglect it. What will happen if we do that? You know, If we neglect this truth or the revelation about the Son of God? <coughs> If we do that, he says, lest we drift away. So when we talk about this drifting away, it is said that he was uh, talking in the context of something like a ship that is anchored uh, momentarily. And then the anchor, if it is removed, what might happen to that ship? We would see that it will slowly start drifting. It will move in the direction of the wind, the waves, and it will just move away to you know any place, no cert certain uh, destination, so to speak. So with that in mind, the writer is giving us that picture and he's saying, when we are careless about the revelation of who Christ is, we run the risk of drifting away like that ship and usually when drifting away happens uh, one of the things that we can we can affirm is it doesn't happen you know in one shot like that it's little by little before you know the ship is somewhere you know a little some uh, thrust of the wind some push of the waves and it's gone so even in our lives when we we may not do it, you know, outrightly and say, oh, I don't believe in God's word or I don't believe in Jesus. But the little things that we say yes to, the, the uh, uh, unrighteous thoughts that we tolerate in our minds, those are the culprits. Little by little, little by little, very subtly, the drifting away may happen. And so he's warning the believers and he's saying, don't give place, as Paul wrote, right? Taking every thought captive and bringing it subject in subjection to the Lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way we need to live. And so he says, be very sincere to hold on, earnest heed to the things that we have heard. The things that we already know, which are the foundation of our faith, we must be strong in those things and never drift away. Verse 2, he says, For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. So, 
he is bringing back the thought of these jewish believers to the time when the law was given to moses i know in what we read it sounds like the word came through angels the word spoken through angels but <coughs> though in english it is angels in the greek it is angelos and angelos has the meaning of uh, a messenger so uh, it's not that angels gave the law they did not give the law the law came by from god and it was issued through moses who was moses at that point he was just a messenger so angelos right so through moses the law was given and uh, if you look at the old under the old covenant it was a really strict way of uh, uh, you know judging people they couldn't transgress even the smallest of commandments and whenever they neg they neglected or they disobeyed there were consequences so he is reminding the believers and saying see even under the uh, old covenant things were so serious and people were called to take heed to what was given to them so how much more we the message came through moses and people were asked to take it seriously this time around the message has come through our lord jesus christ okay he is the one who has died on the cross for us so we need to take up what jesus has done for us very very seriously so that's why he's saying if we neglect so great a salvation or the work that the lord jesus has done for us we should not be doing that and in verse 4 he says god also being witness both with signs and wonders with various miracles and gifts of the holy spirit according to his own will so apart from the work that jesus did on the cross and uh, his teaching his ministry we know that jesus taught he healed and he worked miracles so we are told that god affirmed the ministry of our lord jesus christ so there were signs wonders miracles gifts of the holy spirit which were all a work of god so there was a genuine demonstration of the power of god through the ministry of jesus and he says that god bearing witness okay so god himself has affirmed the work of our lord jesus christ so when the word of god the truth of god and the truth of the salvation that has been provided for us has come so powerfully god has backed it up god has backed up the work of jesus he's just asking us this question how can you neglect it it's come so powerfully and just because we are going through some difficulties and challenges you know would you just let it go would you just neglect it like that please don't do that but that's that's the manner in which he is speaking to the believers even for us today there can be very many temptations around us uh, and just because the going gets tough letting go of our faith in god or you know just making some compromises here and there it may be easier right it it's definitely going to be easier uh, when you just live a life where there's least resistance you know like water no resistance you pour water it will just flow wherever the the uh, yeah, sort of you know there's there's a dip it'll just flow easily in that direction sometimes we want a life like that where things are so easy going and no difficulties no challenges uh, and uh, sometimes we hope life is like that when we believe in jesus but it's not even jesus said in this world you will have tribulation but take heart i have overcome the world there are going to be challenges and difficulties and especially when we believe in jesus uh, the the journey may not be easy but that is not a good enough excuse for us to let go of our faith and so in this way he's encouraging the believers and saying what we have is too great to let go so don't let it go verse 5 he says for he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels 
but one testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. So there's a lot that is said here. If we want to just shorten it and bring out the essence, it's talking about the completeness of the deputization of man. We've talked about this when we did the subject believer's authority. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, we read how God created man in his own image. And then he made man and woman the rulers of this world and said, you rule over um, you know, the, the, the land, you rule over uh, the sea, the creatures of the sea, the creatures of the sky. So man and woman were given authority and dominion on the earth. That's what this entire passage talks about. And he says that God did not give this earth to the angels, but he gave it to man. And he made man responsible for this world. And uh, uh, there's one point here that may sort of bring in a little bit of confusion. In verse 7, he says, you have made him a little lower than the angels. So then the question arises. Yes, God gave the earth to man and woman to rule and reign. Uh, but did he make man as a lesser being of some sort in comparison to angels? The answer would be no. So it's not about greater and lesser. It's just about the heavenly glory. Now, because as we read on, we will see that even for Jesus, the same thing is stated. So in verse 9, it says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. So you see, it's the same manner of talking. But is Jesus lower than the angels? Definitely not. Because we've just justified the fact that the angels are subject to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, So then what is the meaning? What is the understanding? It only means that when we are human, we lack heavenly glory. That's all. Nothing else to it. We lack heavenly glory. And in that context, <coughs> excuse me, in that context, first he stated that man made a little lower than the angels. And then later he says, you know, Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. So now what he has told us is that man is created for dominion on the earth. What about Jesus? Verse 9, he says, but you see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels, meaning God became a man. Jesus became a man. He put on humanity. Otherwise, there's no way the Lord Jesus can be made lower than the angels. So we have clarity here that Jesus became a man. Unless he became a man, you can't say this about him. Why did he become a man? Verse 9 continues, For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. It's so amazing that Jesus came to die. You live to die. Sometimes we sing a, a song like that. But think about it. Who would choose a mandate like that? To live in order to die. It really shows the great love of God for us. First of all, God becoming a man. That is incredible love. Secondly, Living to die, to taste death for everyone. That's why he came. And in verse 10, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Okay, made a little lower than the angels. So what do we see here? We're seeing here that 
being the creator himself jesus chose to become a human being and die as a human being because there are implications of doing something like that he knew that that was the only way to redeem man and that is why he actually did it and so a term that is given here for him is captain of their salvation he was the one who made a way uh, for salvation for mankind and it also says perfect through sufferings jesus was made perfect through sufferings now my question is did jesus need to uh, suffer in order to become perfect any thoughts on that made perfect through sufferings yes he died to bring salvation that we understand but made perfect through sufferings did sufferings make him perfect um i just have a thought i don't know if it's right no yeah go ahead yeah so maybe to become a perfect man maybe he had to go through the suffering maybe that's what i i look at it like might be right might be wrong yeah okay thanks jafina for sharing that thought so when we talk about jesus <coughs> even later on in the passage we'll see that uh, though he was tempted in different ways uh, he went through everything but he was victorious over temptation over sin so jesus was already perfect in that sense then what is this being made perfect through sufferings so it's not talking about uh like jesus maturing any further by the sufferings like sufferings having a quality to to make jesus better than who he was it's not like that but what it means is that jesus experienced uh jesus had a human experience so uh that that made him a uh, an understanding high priest that made him a uh, uh, an understanding savior because he had a he had a complete human experience okay he underwent pain sorrow uh, which is a part of human life so that's what it means we could also say that when it says sufferings those sufferings we know jesus went through uh, the trial and uh, uh, physically he was assaulted uh, he went through pain of every kind all of that he did through his obedience but it is not to say that those things made jesus perfect no that that wouldn't be the meaning he was already perfect but he had a human experience uh and he underwent the sufferings as he went up to the cross which made him more if you may want to use the word well acquainted with being human well acquainted with humanity so that is the understanding that we get okay so is that okay everyone or, or uh, any further questions to that okay not really all right so let's move on now uh it gets even better we just saw that jesus was fully human he shared in our humanity uh experienced the way we experience now from verses 11 to 13 we are told that jesus uh can be referred to as our brother okay so how much better can it get verse 11 for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one so jesus is sharing uh with us in that humanity and uh, he is relating to us he who sanctifies is him it's the lord jesus who has sanctified us 
those who are being sanctified is us and the scripture says we are all one because he became a man god became a man and then he says for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren and having shared in our humanity he is even okay with calling us brothers and sisters so jesus our brother to verse 12 saying i will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly i will sing praise to you and again i will put my trust in him and again here am i and the children whom god has given me so he is ready to relate with us as brothers and uh, he is also proclaiming the greatness of god to us okay uh, in the assembly of the people in the midst of the assembly i will sing praise to you jesus is glorifying the father in our midst so i i hope everyone is uh, in sync with me or uh, has the ship drifted already <laughs> meaning in your mind you're elsewhere okay so you're there great great yeah that's good to know so the essence as i shared earlier is that jesus has shared in our humanity now uh we will look at verses 14 to 18 in the next class because i'll have to elaborate on it whereas uh, we have only about 2 minutes left right now so we can wrap up yeah any any thoughts or questions hebrews chapter 2 Um, when it says in verse ten, uh, in bringing many sons to glory, uh, can you just let me know what the phrase actually means? Okay, so it is referring to. the lost glory of man or the lost dominion of man after adam and eve sin so we lost it but jesus paid for paid the price and it was restored back to us ha huh. bringing many sons to glory bringing us back to that original glory that was meant for us okay um <clears throat> yeah there's another uh, part regarding jesus facing death and restoring back the glory to us and uh, what exactly he has done for us but i think we'll we'll come to that in the next class so let's stop here uh we could pray and close and i just want to request uh, any one of us to lead in prayer Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the beautiful class that we had. God, we stand in awe of you. How you are equal to God, and how you chose to come down as a human for us. And God, your plans, your way of thinking—it's all uh, beyond imagination. And God, I just pray and I ask that God, as we are learning this truth, uh, as it was written in the starting that help us to never let go of it help us to um be with the truth in our life and to uh, have our anchor really strong in your word so that we will never be drift away uh, to the left or the right but we'll always keep our eyes on you and we'll keep moving forward towards the purpose and the calling that you have given us jesus and god i give all my classmates in your hands bless them all in the name of jesus thank you for pastor nancy who taught us all these things god we thank you for this beautiful time and we give the rest of the day in your hands in jesus name i pray amen 
Amen. Thank you, Jafina. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Uh, have a blessed day ahead.